morning, everyone. My name is Dave Rodofsky, and I'm one of the elders here at St. David's, and it's a pleasure to welcome you on this uh, rather cold Sunday morning, but thanks for turning out. Um, the announcements are as printed in the bulletin, and uh, uh, they're fine to read as is. Um, I'd like to welcome uh, the Reverend Jim Russell, who's our guest minister this morning. David Sturdivant and the family are in Ontario for another couple of weeks. And the only additional announcement, we'd like to uh, thank Gerhard Basler and the family for donating the flowers here this morning. Thank you. Please be seated. morning. Welcome to our worship at St. David's. The call to worship is based on Psalm 100, which is a joyful psalm of praise, <clears throat> as so many of the psalms are. David was a, uh, King David was a, a writer, a, a singer, a, a worship leader, and a king, and a soldier. So he was uh, quite an amazing Man. Let's join together. <clears throat> Shout for joy to the Lord all the earth. Know that the Lord is God. It is He who made us, and we are His. We are His people, the sheep of His pasture. For the Lord is good, and his love endures forever. His faithfulness continues through all generations. Let us continue to praise the Lord by singing 
374. Oh, for a thousand tongues to sing. Please be seated.
Thank you so much. That was beautiful. Would you join together with me in prayer? It is good to give thanks to you, O Lord, to praise you and to sing songs of joy in your presence. We thank you for the gift of this new day. We thank you for your love for us and for all people. Particularly today, we give you thanks for the good news about Jesus Christ being spread into all the world, to all people. We thank you for the Christian church of which we are a part, the whole Christian church throughout the whole world. As we worship this morning, we ask that you would fill us with your Holy Spirit and draw us closer to yourself. In Jesus Christ's name we pray. Let us continue to pray as we confess before the Lord our sins. Lord, we do approach you knowing that you are compassionate and merciful. You know all about us. You know all our weaknesses and the sins that so easily trip us up. Yet you love us with a love that is, we find it hard to understand. <clears throat> have mercy on us now for the sins we have committed. Forgive us and cleanse us. In Jesus' name we pray. We're reminded by the word of God that if we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. If we claim we have not sinned, we make him out to be a liar and his word has no place within us. Let's continue to pray as our, Jesus our Lord, our Savior taught us, saying, Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive those our debtors. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever and ever. Amen. <clears throat> the children's hymn this morning is 435, All Things Bright and Beautiful.
like to invite the children to come forward now for the children's time. Lots of children. <laughs> I'm a little bit emotional this morning with the children because our daughter Lara in England just had a baby yesterday after two days of basically being in labor in the process. And so she uh, gave birth to a beautiful baby boy by the name of Theodore Teddy for sure. So we're pretty excited about that. And we'll be going over in um, about a month, spend time with them. Let's pray together before we hear from God's word. Almighty God, in you are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. Open our eyes that we may see the wonders of your word 
and give us grace that we may clearly understand and freely choose the way of your wisdom through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. The Old Testament reading this morning is Genesis chapter 1, verses 1 to 5. Uh, It's probably the easiest one in the Bible to find because it's page 1. So page 1 in the Pew Bible, Genesis 1, chapter chapter 1, verses 1 to 5. The beginning. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Now the earth was formless and empty. Darkness was over the surface of the deep, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the waters. And God said, Let there be light, and there was light. God saw that the light was good, and he separated the light from the darkness. God called the light day and the darkness he called night. And there was evening, and there was morning, the first day. We'll read the responsive psalm, Psalm 29, which is on page 826, 826, in the Pew Bible. Psalm 29, I'll read the first verse, and if you would read the second verse and alternately so on. Psalm 29. A Psalm of David. Ascribe to the Lord, you heavenly beings, ascribe to the Lord glory and strength. The voice of the Lord is over the waters. The glory of God thunders. The Lord thunders over the mighty waters. The voice of the Lord Lord breaks the cedars. The Lord breaks in pieces the cedars of Lebanon. The voice of the Lord strikes with flashes of lightning. The voice of the Lord twists the oaks and strips the forest bare, and in his temple all cry, Glory! The Lord gives strength to his people. The Lord blesses his people with peace. May God add his blessings to those readings of his heavenly words. We'll continue on with God's word. Reading from Acts chapter 19. Verses 1 to 12. And... um, I'm going to focus the sermon on that particular uh, passage this morning because um, Epiphany, which is uh, what we're celebrating today, um, celebrates the, the wise men and Jesus' baptism, but really the giving of the good news of the gospel out into the world, into the Gentile world, sy- uh, symbolized or represented by the Magi, the wise men. So this is a... <clears throat> This is about Paul as he goes to the very large Roman city of Ephesus to begin uh, or to continue on with the spreading of the gospel and the building of churches in the Mediterranean area. While Apollos was at Corinth, Paul took the road through the interior and arrived at Ephesus. There he found some disciples and asked them, Did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? They answered, no, we have not even heard that there is a Holy Spirit. So Paul asked, then what baptism did you receive? John's baptism, they replied. Paul said, John's baptism was a baptism of repentance. He told the people to believe in the one coming after him, 
that is, in Jesus. <clears throat> On hearing this, they were baptized into the name of the Lord Jesus. When Paul placed his hands on them, the Holy Spirit came on them, and they spoke in tongues and prophesied. There were about 12 men in all, in all there. Paul entered the synagogue and spoke boldly there for three months, arguing persuasively about the kingdom of God. But some of them became obstinate, and they refused to believe and publicly maligned the way. So Paul left them. He took the disciples with him and had discussions daily in the lecture hall of Tyrannus. This went on for two years so that all the Jews and Greeks who lived in the province of Asia heard the word of the Lord. God did extraordinary miracles through the hands of Paul so that even handkerchiefs and aprons that had touched him were taken to the sick and their illnesses were cured and the evil spirits left them. Also, Mark's Gospel, chapter 1, verses 1 to 11. Now, on my verse version, what I'm reading from is the New International Version, so it's a slightly different version than the ones in the Pew Bible. In the beginning of the Gospel about Jesus Christ, the Son of God, it is written in Isaiah the prophet, I will send my messenger ahead of you who will prepare your way, a voice of one calling in the desert, prepare the way for the Lord, make straight paths for him. And so John came baptizing in the desert region and preaching a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. The whole Judean countryside and all the people of Jerusalem went out to him. Confessing their sins, they were baptized by him in the Jordan River. John wore clothing made of camel's hair with a leather belt around his waist, and he ate locusts and wild honey. And this was his message. After me will come one more powerful than I, the thongs of whose sandals I am not, uh, not worthy to stoop down and untie. I baptize you with water, but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. At that time, Jesus came from Nazareth in Galilee and was baptized by John in the Jordan. As Jesus was coming up out of the water, he saw heaven being torn open and the Spirit descending on him like a dove. And a voice came from heaven, You are my Son, whom I love. With you I am well pleased. At once the Spirit sent him out into the desert, and he was in the desert forty days, being tempted by Satan. He was with the wild animals, and angels attended him. Let's join together in singing the beautiful hymn number 461, Be Thou My Vision, and let's stand together. <clears throat>
Please be seated. Ernst Rollman is uh, going to come now for a few moments. Ernst is uh, going to uh, Switzerland for discipleship training for six months, I think. Three months of uh, discipleship training and three months on a, um, a mission, a uh, missionary work, church or missionary work. M many of you may not know about uh, Youth with a Mission YWAM, but our daughter, who just gave birth, uh, had spent two years with uh, YWAM uh, and uh, was training in Hawaii which is a nice place to train, and uh, she trained there, and then she went on a mission in India, and then she uh, came back on staff and did a, a training and a mission in Nepal and Tibet. So uh, we know about, come on forth there, um, Ernst, and we're going to take a little bit of time right after the, um, you can come here, it's fine, whatever. Yeah, right. uh, pray for you as well. All right, thank you. Good morning. Um, I, I did want to say Romans 8.28 has been in my head a lot lately, uh, which is, we know that in all things God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. And I just turned 40, and I'm working with youth with a mission. <laughs> so... Uh, I wanted to first say there's a note of thanks to all of you that supported the uh, Food for Thought uh, ministry over this past year. I was blessed to have the opportunity to lead that group uh, while James and Amy uh, were in Australia. And I want to thank again everyone who contributed support, uh, some financially, some provided meals. We had uh, some speaking, uh, Reverend Russell, uh, Michelle, my father gave uh, uh, presentations, uh, as well uh, Peter. And Chong Yi uh, gave presentations, and uh, everyone who helped, I want to thank you again uh, in whichever way that you did help us. It was a real blessing to, to lead that group, and it was a real time of change for me the past year. I think that opportunity to lead Food for Thought was an open door provided to me to further deepen my relationship with God, to learn how to serve, and... Um, so I'm going to speak a little bit about what Reverend Russell's already talked about here in terms of a Youth with a Mission and the Discipleship Training School, which I'm going to start next Sunday in Switzerland. Uh, so Discipleship uh, Training School, it's a non-denominational training that takes place in uh, many locations all over the world. Uh, helps students to discover their calling, to gain experience in missions with others in an international setting. So there's a lecture phase, and then there's an outreach phase. Uh, this Discipleship Training School, or DTS, that I'm going to be attending is in Wieler, Switzerland. So there's a curriculum. There are going to be lectures uh, with speakers. There are going to be personal and joint times with God. Uh, practical work, coaching, fun, communal living. Uh, and additionally, this one is going to focus on uh, issues of justice in the world, and that deals with human trafficking, um, forced prostitution, bonded labor, exploitation of children, and other weak members in society. So I'm going to be training for about two and a half months there in uh, Wieler in Switzerland, and then we go on a mission outreach for another two and a half months somewhere. And I get to find that out later. So in the next two to four weeks or so, I get to find out where we're actually going. Uh, I think the last one was in Malawi. Um, so I'm excited to find out where I'm going. Uh, <laughs> that's with all things. Um, so I'm fortunately financially able to support this particular uh, mission. Uh, there are some students that are joining us uh, who are going to need some help coming from other areas. And so if those a few people asked if you're interested in contributing, you certainly could if, if that's something you want to do, and I can help pass that on to them. But the main thing I'm really uh, asking about is uh, your prayers. Um, that is most important support, of course, for anyone. And um, I greatly appreciate if you keep me in your prayers while I travel on Friday. Um, for a, prayers for a good adjustment to the school, discipline, especially for someone who's returning to campus life. And I'm told the two hours of chores that we do daily are not as optional as they are for a single guy like myself who can just let the dishes sort of sit there for a few days. Did, 
don't look kindly to that, so I'm going to need discipline and uh, protection over our study and uh, then on the mission outreach as well. So please pray that I, I would bring honor to God. Um, this would help me as well to discern my path beyond the school. And I do intend to do up a newsletter as well to keep people updated on prayer needs and, and what's going on. And, uh, and God willing, June 17th, I think I'm back here just in time for Father's Day to keep you updated. So thank you very much. We're, we're going to spend uh, just a moment praying for Ernst. So um, could I invite the elders, who, whatever elders are here right now, to come on forward. We'll pray together with Ernst. I know it's always good to have the support of the church when you're going out in a, in a mission like that. And, um, and as you said, the financial issues are, uh, are provided, but the, the, the support and the encouragement and prayers are very important. So, Father God, we pray together now for Ernst as you uh, send him forth, just as you had sent Paul and so many others uh, over the years, uh, not knowing where he's going. You know where he's going to Switzerland, but he doesn't know where his mission is going to be. So we ask for special blessing on him, uh, Lord, and all the things that he has mentioned. We ask for your help in this area, including the travel and the adjustment to campus life and the adjustment to, to student life and the study in the end. And uh, Father, we pray in many ways that you can enlarge his heart so that he may share that heart with those in the world where he goes to, to minister. In Jesus Christ's name we pray. Amen. Is there any other prayers that anyone else wants to pray? Or? Good. Thank you. Very exciting. I find this all very exciting. And uh, having gone through it with our daughter, Lara, and uh, it uh, is something very special. Um, as I say, you may not know a lot about Youth with a Mission, but they are a very dynamic organization. And um, one thing I can assure you, Ernst, <laughs> you won't be the same when you come back. <laughs> they. Uh, yeah, they're, uh, they're a very zealous, keen group of people, and uh, they've done a lot of wonderful work in the world over the years. Would you join me together in prayer as we, uh, we listen to God's Word, we hear from God's Word this morning? Father, we thank you once again for your Word, the Bible, and for the truth and guidance that it gives to us, the inspiration. And so we pray for your uh, touch, your inspiration, the help and uh, work and wisdom and revelation of your Holy Spirit. And we give you the praise and the glory for this in Jesus' name. Amen. It's good to be with you here once again this morning and uh, to see a few familiar faces. And um, I, um, in 1987, had the privilege of going to what we call the Holy Land, Israel and Egypt, the Sinai Desert. And um, when I was in the desert, we, I stayed in the desert overnight. And uh, so that was in 1987, in early November. And so at 3 o'clock in the morning, we got up, 3 a.m. in the morning, got up in the middle of the desert, and it's amazing I don't know if you've ever experienced a desert before, but the Sinai Desert is a place of tremendous extremes. It's a very stark land, not only sand, but, but rock. And um, we were camped not very far from Mount Sinai, where the Ten Commandments were received, as far as we know. Uh, that's the mountain. And uh, during the day, that day, it was 90 degrees, uh, what, which is what, uh, 32 degrees Celsius, and at night, when we were getting up to go, um, to get up uh, in the middle of the night to climb Mount Sinai, 
it was minus two degrees Celsius. So you can see the extremes that uh, that stark lands. For the people of Israel to live there for 40 years, only God could have helped them to survive. There's, there's no other way when you see that land. So we climbed, <clears throat> the group I was with, climbed Mount Sinai uh, at 3 o'clock in the morning. And as we got up to the top of the mountain, the sun, and that was our plan, the sun was just coming up over Mount Sinai. It's a very powerful spiritual experience. Of course, uh, we know that uh, spiritual uh, enlightenment experiences are related to mountains uh, quite often, aren't they? There's, there's certain places on earth that we associate with spiritual uh, enlightenment, and mountains are one of them. And the Lord gave the Ten Commandments and stone tablets to Moses on Mount Sinai. So it was a very powerful moment for me personally to be able to be there, experience that, and watch the sun come up over this amazing land. And to think about what the Ten Commandments represented for Israel. Because for Israel, the law, the Ten Commandments, the ceremonial law, all the laws associated with the Ten Commandments and the giving of the law became fundamental for the Israel, the Jewish people, the Israel uh, nation, people uh, uh, of Abraham's descendants, to follow God. And yet, if you think about different ways in which we can serve and draw close to the Lord, to God, to the Almighty. Law has its troubles and its problems when you think about it because there was problems from the very beginning with, uh, with giving to the law. Uh, as Moses went down the mountain, we find that uh, the people of Israel had turned to idols wondering, where is this man of uh, Moses? He's up in the mountain. We don't know where he is, whether he'll ever come back. And so they decided to have their own religious uh, celebrations and idol idolatrous, uh, they made a golden calf. So, but for the people of Israel, the keeping of the law presented a lot of problems over the years, as you can see in the Old Testament. And if you think about it yourself, laws tell you what to do. <laughs> they give you things that you should do and shouldn't do, but they don't give you the inner power or, and probably what's most important, the inner motivation to do the things that we know are right. We have a conscience, but external laws are important. I mean, when we're driving our cars, we have laws that, that tell us we shouldn't do that and we shouldn't do this. We shouldn't uh, talk on our cell phones or text while we drive, but tons of people still do. So laws are rather inadequate ways of, of doing things in many ways. They're very blunt instruments. Uh, the better way, of course, to have a, a just society and a righteous society and a loving society is that everybody would, in their hearts say, it's dangerous for me to text. <laughs> it's dangerous for me to talk on the cell phone. Texting is probably even more dangerous. And uh, I'll be distracted and have an accident and somebody could be hurt. So out of a heart of love, rather than a law, people, every, if everyone said that, it would be a good society. So laws do have a lot of problems associated with them when we think of trying to draw close to the Lord, to God, by laws, by legalism. And uh, so there was problems with law, with legalism from the very beginning. This morning we celebrate the bringing of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the good news of Jesus Christ to the Gentile world as represented by the, um, you know, I always want to say the three wise men. We don't know there was three, we know there was three gifts. The Magi who had come from probably modern day Iraq to, uh, to Bethlehem, to Israel, to Jerusalem and to Israel to worship Jesus. And so Today being Epiphany, or yesterday being Epiphany, we, uh, we celebrate that fact. The way of Christ was a new way. The way of faith, the way of grace was a new way, different from the way of law, ceremonial law, the Ten Commandments, and following that. And the Lord had plans to supersede the legal way of serving God and drawing close to God. And in the prophet Jeremiah, he says this in Jeremiah 31. It's a very important scripture. 
The days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the people of Israel and with the people of Judah. It will be not like the covenant that I made with their ancestors when I took them by the hand to lead them out of Egypt because they broke my covenant. Though I was a husband to them, declares the Lord, this is the covenant I will make with the people of Israel after that time, declares the Lord. I will put my law in their minds and write it on their hearts. I will be their God and they will be my people. No longer will they teach their neighbor or say to one another, know the Lord, because they will all know me from the least of them to the greatest, declares the Lord, for I will forgive their wickedness and will remember their sins no more. Although the law of God is good, we're not saying that there's anything wrong with the Ten Commandments or the law is holy and good, but there's a better way. And the better way is the faith, is our faith in Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ came to the world not only to be born as a little baby and we celebrate at Christmas, but to, to grow up and to teach and to show us, to disciple us, and to die for our sins. That's the central and to be raised again. The central aspect of our faith is around Jesus' death for our sins so that we can be forgiven our sins and draw close to God, uh, that there be no impediment between us and the Lord. And so we will have that, that unencumbered um, entrance into God's presence and to come to him. Uh, we can be reconciled to God and draw close to him. As Romans said in, in chapter 5 and 1, therefore... Being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. And to have peace with someone is a wonderful thing, isn't it? When you're um, in some kind of conflict with somebody, to be reconciled and to be forgiven and then to have peace is a beautiful experience and feeling. And the same is true for our relationship to God. Because of our sins... We were estranged from God, separated from God. And so no law, no legalistic way of approaching God is going to help because the law shows us what we should do but doesn't really give us the power to do that. Only the Holy Spirit living within us and a changed heart, changing our motivations, changing our, our deepest desires and motivations can do that. And so once we have faith in Jesus Christ, we're born again by his spirit. We have a new heart. Holy Spirit lives within us. Paul spoke very clearly about the Holy Spirit and the importance. We are sons of, and daughters of God now, and we have eternal life living within us. This is the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ. When we think of um, the spreading of the gospel of Jesus in, to all the world, we often quite quickly think of St. Paul, Paul the Apostle, who was a Pharisee of the Pharisees. If anybody lived a, a, a holy and religious life, he, his was a fastidious life, very, very devoted as a Pharisee, a, a group of Ju, a Judaic group, and they followed a legalistic way to serving God. And so if anybody was a zealous legalistic follower of God, Paul was. He did everything that could be done to follow God by the legalistic way, following the law. But somehow or other, peace within his heart or inner fulfillment, spiritual inner fulfillment escaped him. And he had deep spiritual turmoil, I think. And that turmoil was probably very similar to the young Augustinian monk Martin Luther had experienced also in his struggle to serve God by doing all kinds of things, by serving God, by fasting, by, by all kinds of means of good works and so on. But it was never enough. It was never enough for Martin Luther. It was never enough for, for Paul. So when Paul met the resurrected Jesus Christ on the road to Damascus, he was so powerfully changed that he dedicated his whole life to serving the Lord for the rest of his life. And on that road to Damascus, through all the striving that Paul did in his life, for all the seeking and searching and, and so fastidiously keeping the law, 
He wasn't satisfied, but on the road to Damascus, he found peace. He found something. He found the resurrected Christ, and he knew immediately that he found what he had been seeking for, for so long, that his heart needed. St. Augustine of Hippo said this, Thou hast made us for ourself, O Lord, and our heart is restless until it rests in thee. And that was Paul's life. And so he's transformed. <clears throat> and at this point we see him in Acts chapter 19. He's on his third missionary journey going out like Ernst to spread the word of God, to spread the gospel, to reach out to those who didn't understand or didn't know the gospel, didn't hear the good news of Jesus Christ. Paul is in Ephesus, a very large city in the Roman Empire, in the Mediterranean area. And t today you can see the ruins, magnificent ruins apparently, of Ephesus, one of the greatest archaeological ruins that can be visited in the ancient world. In, it's in modern-day Turkey. I was about two and a half hours away from there when I was in the Navy. We were in Turkey, but I didn't actually go there. But uh, some friends of mine went there and were very impressed with uh, the ruins. It was a very, very large city. And so Paul went there, and he found uh, what seems to be 12 disciples. And it's not totally clear what those disciples believe, but they didn't have the full understanding of who Jesus Christ was. They seemed to have been disciples of John the Baptist or had only received the baptism of, uh, of repentance that John the Baptist had preached. And uh, so Paul met them, and you can see that Paul's way of life and his, his whole attitude and his heart was totally different than he was before, because before it was all legalism, all laws, all strictly keeping things uh, to serve God and to follow God. Now, the first thing he says to them, as recorded here, is, did you receive the Holy Spirit since you believed? So the Holy Spirit uh, was very, very important in Paul's message. And they said, no, we, we didn't uh, even hear there was a Holy Spirit. So their teaching had been quite inadequate. So Paul teaches them about who Jesus is, that John the Baptist had preached a baptism of repentance, but also preaching, as we read in the Mark's Gospel this morning, how Jesus would come after, and that Jesus was the Messiah. Jesus was the, the one that, that the Jewish nation had been looking for who would uh, deliver them. And so they believed in Jesus and were baptized by immersion at that time, no doubt, if they had enough water. And I would think they would in Ephesus. And, um, and so they, then Paul placed his hands on them and they were filled with the Holy Spirit, spoke in tongues and prophesied. And so in that city, we hear later, the things that Paul did in, in sharing the gospel and telling the good news, mostly the Gentile world, he first went to the Jewish synagogue, some believed, but some rejected him. So then he went to a, a hall and he, for two years, uh, preached the gospel, shared the gospel, had discussions with people, and no doubt won disciples to Christ, as was his way. And powerful things happened in Ephesus. Uh, doesn't always happen that way. You know, uh, people go and, and, and try and win converts to Christ in different parts of the world and plant churches. And sometimes it's a long struggle. It's a long, long struggle sometimes. And not much happens. One or two disciples and they plant a church based on that. But then uh, marvelous things sometimes happen, as in the Presbyterian missions in, in South Korea. A great, tremendous growth uh, ha happened. And the same thing happened in Ephesus. And they were accompanied by miracles of an outstanding nature. Luke, of course, is used to traveling with Paul. Luke is, is writing the book of Acts and has written Luke, the Gospel of Luke. And Luke is used to seeing the miracles that accompany the preaching of the Gospel and, and accompany uh, not only Paul's ministry, but others' ministries. But in this place, he says... Not just miracles, but extraordinary miracles. Extraordinary miracles happened. So that, uh, can you believe this? I believe it. But uh, pieces of clothing that Paul had, because he was a tent maker, uh, pieces of clothing, aprons and, and handkerchiefs that were sent out from his body, were sent to the sick and those who had demons, and the, the sick were healed. 
and uh, demons left them. So, how do you explain it? You can't explain it. These are miracles that happen. And uh, no doubt, I, I doubt if very much if Paul came up with this idea, well, here's a new way to, to heal people. <laughs> you know, this is the sovereign work of God, and uh, things happen that we can't explain. And uh, miracles happen. And so that helped the church grow as well. Because some people will not believe until they see miracles. And so they're, therefore, their faith is encouraged when they see someone healed. And this is one of the things that happened in Ephesus. Tremendous miracles also accompanied the preaching of the gospel. And the church grew in a, in a marvelous way. A very large church eventually. And uh, Paul stayed there for a number of years. So we celebrate today the preaching or the sharing of the good news of the gospel in all the world. And that's as well for us in our own humble way. That's part of our life of who we are as Christians. We are called as well to share the good news of the gospel of our faith with others around us. Not always easy. It's awkward at times. On um, Friday nights, I volunteer at a coffee house in a downtown church, uh, offer coffee, uh, tea, hot chocolate, uh, snacks to people off the street who come in, whoever is there who want to come in. And, um, you know, we reach out in love with, with food and, and, uh, and care. And if it's appropriate, we also share the gospel with them, share our faith with them. I have a I've written up. Uh, how I became a Christian uh, back in 1975, and I, uh, I printed it up and I give it to him. I used to use that in prison as a way uh, to share my faith. And, you know, sometimes it's joyful sharing your faith and, and meaningful. Other times it's really awkward <laughs> and difficult for, for many of us. I have found it so over the years to share with family members or uh, with friends, you know, this is my faith, this is why I believe in God, because... Today, in today's world, not everybody does. We are, in, at least in North America, it seems like we're going against the stream in having faith in Jesus Christ and being Christians. So, but it is an important part of our faith, and there's many different ways that we can do that. Alpha is a really wonderful uh, call it a program, one way in which we can share our faith with, with others and to reach out into the community. Because... I have found there's a lot of people seeking answers in this world. There's a lot of people seeking spiritual truth. There's a lot of people asking, why are we here on earth today? How, why is history, human history the way it is? Why are there so many wars? Why is there evil in the world? There's a lot of people asking, is there a God? You know, there's a lot of people seeking. And so maybe over coffee you get a chance to share your faith with somebody in the future. Let us pray together. Lord, we thank you this morning for the faith in Jesus Christ that we have, that your Holy Spirit lives within us. Strengthen our faith, each one of us, we pray today, as we worship you today and as we go out into the community. We pray for divine appointments, opportunities to share our faith with a friend or with someone, uh, a colleague at work, uh, to be able to share why we have this wonderful hope and faith in you, why we have an, the attitudes that we do have. And we pray this in Jesus Christ's name. Amen. Let us respond to God's word by offering our gifts and uh, to the Lord. Offering now be received.
bring our offerings and gifts to you and place them before you on your altar now. And to be acceptable in your sight and uh, we pray for all the work of this congregation and for the Presbyterian Church of Canada. In Jesus' name we pray. Please be seated. So continue to pray for Ernst as he goes and uh, I know there's many other needs in our uh, in our midst in our congregation. Let's join together in prayer. Our Father in heaven, we thank you that you watch over and protect us by your great and almighty power. We thank you for the gift of every person in this congregation. We ask your blessing upon each one as we continue to worship you this morning. It is a great privilege, our Lord, to come here and to be able to worship you, to know that we have freedom to to worship you, and um, everyone has a part. We thank you for the the choir and the musicians, everyone who participates, all the Sunday school teachers, all of the elders, everybody who uh, takes part and has an important part in the team of, uh, of worshiping and developing the worship. We pray for the continuing work of this congregation. Pray for uh, David and his whole family as they uh, are on vacation. Bless them and give them rest and uh, refreshment, we pray, and safely bring them back here again. We pray that the good news of Jesus Christ would continue to be spread throughout every corner of our world. Send us out, O Lord, to plant the message of the gospel the good news about Jesus Christ within willing hearts and may it grow there and bring forth much fruit. We pray for those like Ernst who go out and share the good news in the world, not only for those who go far flung away from this area, our our city, but those of us who share the gospel here and do mission work here within this city and within this area. May there be many opportunities for us to be able to, uh, to share the good news. Watch over and protect all of us as we do that, as we are in the spiritual battle. We pray as well for anyone who may be sick in the congregation or those who are of our uh, loved ones who may be ill, who are unable to get out this morning. We pray for those who are at home. We pray for their healing, believing as we read this morning that you heal and that you do miracles. We pray that anyone who is sick would be healed, O oh God. We also do pray for all the medical uh, personnel to, to help and to do their work with wisdom and skill. <coughs> and so now, Father, any time, we just take a time of silence before you to bring forth any other special needs that might be uh, in our hearts and our lives to bring before you. Pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Our closing hymn this morning celebrates the gospel and the good news, the grace of Jesus Christ. Uh, 670 Amazing Grace.
It's been wonderful to be here with you this morning to worship together and invite you to come and have a time of fellowship and, and coffee and tea um, after the service. Certainly warmly invited to come out and share together. May the God who gives endurance and encouragement give you the same attitude of mind towards each other that Christ Jesus had, so that with one mind and one voice you may glorify the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Um.